Welcome to the Virtualization Cloud Security Podcast, episode number 150, I think, something like that. Been going on for a while, and um, this is only our second, though, episode of a recorded podcast, and joining me today is Mike Foley, VMware Technical Marketing Security Uh Guy, and Tom Howarth, a fellow analyst at the Virtualization Practice. Welcome, both of you. Howdy. And... Uh Today, I want to talk about Venom and really the lack of poison that's in this this so-called attack, because it seems more hype than it is actual damage. I haven't seen or heard of any one case of this in the wild. Have you guys? No. No. And to be fair, the uh, company that reported it did say they hadn't seen anything in the wild as well. So it's such a big deal, nothing in the wild, it's not impacting anybody, but let's make it a huge deal. I think the hype is more is high as seems I, to be I more think, important than the actual attack. I think the the technical work that was done to discover it was very good. Absolutely. Right? Um I think the 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 researchers that that did their job did a pretty good job. Um I thought the hype by all the clickbait trade rags was just over the top. Yeah. And they're, they're equating it to as deadly as Heartbleed, but Heartbleed has in the not wild attacks. Close. And not even close. They were saying most major data centers are at risk. Really? Well, <laughs> it's clickbait. Theoretically, <laughs> it's clickbait. Theoretically, you know, Amazon came out right away and said, we're not at risk. So they're must to have all those features turned off. So they're not a problem. Yep. And that's kind of one of the biggest data centers in the world. Yeah. Um, Azure is not at risk. So the v- second Amazon. biggest data so center is not at risk. The v- 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 cloud is not at risk. So the second so and third v- biggest v- data centers in the world. ESX. Yeah. So the second and third biggest data centers in the world are not at risk. Microsoft's so who, not at risk. I'll give them a shout out. Just so Microsoft, like let's be, let's be clear here. Microsoft and VMware are not part of this. But I will say that in the past, there have been a t- similar attacks against VMware and there have been similar attacks against Hyper-V. Because these these peripheral devices that we all have, no one really uses in a virtual environment. But they are still there for various reasons. Well, you know what? There will always be attacks. Always. Yes. Forever. And as I said, as I said yesterday on Twitter, I'm pulling it up here. Um, oh, it was right there. Where the hell did it go? You know, you, using an eight-year, uh, I said, as interesting as this was, it, and as it, as interesting as the the 2007 um, escape that was done at Black Hat uh, against VMware was back then. Um, that was done on an eight, uh, a Type 2 hypervisor from eight years ago and is not terribly relevant to what we're discussing today. Well, there was an attack against VMware around ESX 4.2, 4.02. Right. That did do the similar thing. It went to a part of the a peripheral, got out into that peripheral, was able to scribble somewhere in memory. Yeah. But they weren't able to do anything with it once they got it in memory. Now, and the reason being is that when you run on a Type 2 hypervisor, the virtual machine manager that surrounds the guest operating system is actually running inside of a true operating system like Windows or Linux. Mm-hmm. And it's part of that operating system. So if you escape it, you're now into that operating system. But on a hyper, type 1 hypervisor like ESXi, Zen, KVM, Hyper-V, Link Secure, and a number of others, yep. when you get out into that area, the virtual machine manager, there's nothing to grab onto. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't fork a shell process and start doing stuff. Because there's no shell process there. Now, there is a theoretical attack that could be used, and I won't go into it because I don't want to propagate, but... Because we never talk about stuff that isn't public. Exactly. This is not public. 
But the key here is is that you would have to actually get something to execute in that no man's land. Right. And that no man's land would have to – if it got something to execute, it would have to grab onto something that was actually usable to do an escape. And so far, as far as I can see, nothing has been like that. Yeah. So, you know, there's always going to be these attacks. Why? Uh, or, or these attempts, or or the or this discussion around VM escape, and I'll tell you exactly why. Because someone who finds a VM escape gets put up on stage at Black Hat like a freaking superhero. <laughs> right? Okay. They okay. think, oh my God, he has found the way to take over the world. Right? It is so much less expensive and so much more effective to break out and escape into the admin's user account than it is to do it on a type one hypervisor. And I agree with you. It's really the difference between sexy, right? Which is I'm going to be the next InfoSec uh, rock star on tour to all of the different conferences and everyone loves me uh, to, oh, Mike's talking about the same old boring stuff of go lock down your users, go lock down your passwords, do better password management, patch your freaking systems. Uh, Any number of these tried and true yet dull and boring and will never get me up on stage at RSA conference or InfoSec or Black Hat. That's, That's really the name of the game. I'm not discounting the – if you can find a breakout you know, at, at the ESXi level, I'm sure I can put you in touch with a number of engineers that would like to hire you. Absolutely. I'll get you a I, job immediately with a number of different companies. With any number of different companies. But it's still far more effective for me to spearfish an admin to open up an Excel spreadsheet that gets malware on his laptop that steals the credentials of your – crappy, very poorly protected environment, and then I take over the world. Tom? You know, it's really the difference between pain and brain. (laughs) I agree completely. You know, it is just like trying to crack a walnut with the proverbial sledgehammer, except it's really a nuclear weapon. Right. In the boring, yeah. in that that boring stuff we've been talking about, I've been talking about since 2004, is still paramount and the most important thing you can do. The lowest hanging fruit of any virtual secure virtual environment security is to protect your management network. Yeah. And if you're not doing that today, give up the ghost, get over yourself, and do it. It's really yeah, that yeah. simple. Yeah, I mean, I did a session at VMworld uh, last year called Fact versus Fiction. Fact versus fiction, ESXi hypervisor security. And I had 500 people in attendance. You never would have gotten 500 people in attendance at a VMware, uh, at, a, at a VMworld talking about security five years ago. No, absolutely not. You may have gotten you would have two. Got <laughs> three, four, yeah. You, and, and we me, probably... Me, it, would, it would have been me and you and some guy who walked in and was mistaken that that in wasn't... The, it, and sense. walked into the wrong room. Right. Exactly. Um, Are you doing that again? Yeah, I, I got asked to repeat it because, believe it or not, and I only found this out just the other day, that was in the top 15. Very good. And I think anybody who's listening to us, this, if you're interested in vSphere security or actually generic hypervisor security, because what Mike talks about is not just vSphere related. It's, it applies to every hypervisor out there. Go, yeah. listen, yeah. learn, yeah. please. Yeah, so one, one of the slides that I put up was a, a picture of an ESXi server with an uptime of 1,400 days. And I said, now, for some of you IT guys out there, you see that as a badge of honor, right? I've got four years of uptime on my servers. How about you, right? I'm sorry, this is not the Irish railway system, and you're not running a VAX. You know, they had a VAX cluster that was up for seven years. And it was still patched. And it was and it was still patched because you could move stuff around just like you can in a VMware environment. So having a server that has an uptime of 1,400 days means you have not applied any security patches in 1,400 days. Exactly. I can't help you. 
if you are complaining to me that your security guy is on your back about VM escape and you haven't patched in 1400 days, who's doing the risk management? Yeah. Right? Who's doing the risk management? It's not as though you your security guy's not. Obviously yep. you're not. So, you know, put it all in perspective. Well, I'm glad Remember, I'm gonna... all this VM escape stuff is super sexy because somebody wants to be the first. Maybe we should put in for a panel. Uh, actually, it's kind of close now, but it would have been great to have a VM escape panel. Um, it almost I it, wouldn't get a whole lot of VMware engineers talking about it. No, you don't need VMware engineers to talk about the fact that it doesn't happen all that much. And if it does, what are you going to do with it anyways? Right. So to your point about the um, the old video driver one, yeah. Uh, in the 5.5 security hardening guide for vSphere, I added a couple of new settings around video driver stuff. Yep. Why do you need a, a full-blown 3D SVGA style uh, device on a headless Linux box? You don't. You right. The, and so I added some I added some guidelines in there that if you know you're running a headless server that doesn't require video memory, here's the setting to disable video memory for that device. Yeah. Now you've just shrunk your risk profile. Now, is it possible? It's software. It's written by humans. There's always going to be a possibility of something. We've done an amazing amount of work since 2009 to lock all this stuff down. But, you know, if you if you have headless physical boxes, they probably just have a Matrox G200 card in it. Absolutely. Right? They don't have a, a you know, uh, an, a, an AMD ATI Velocity card or whatever they're called nowadays, right? So you don't need, if, if you don't need it, don't install it. Therefore, your attack vectors are much smaller. Exactly. But you're going it's, to... Just it's common, common sense. sense. It's common sense, but you actually are finding in the in the um, arena of data centers now more and more graphics drivers are showing up. So you got to really be careful with these settings if you're going to be using the vGPU setting information as well. So even though we may say there's a compensating control of disabling all peripheral devices, and by the way, that's been a compensating control and a control for every VM since the Dawn of VMs. If you're not using it, get rid of it, disable it. It's right. also been a compensated control, even in the physical world. Absolutely. Yeah. Floppy drives. Find yeah. a Mac right. today CD that has. A, find right. a find a Mac today that has a floppy drive or a CD-ROM. I a actually removed the DVD drive out of my MacBook Pro, and installed a second SSD drive for VMs. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I did the I same thing. I can't remember the last time I put a DVD into my MacBook Pro. I think I only did it maybe three times. And, Tom, what do they do at secure sites? Grade A epoxy? Oh, secure hmm. sites, USBs, uh, super glue in there, everything. All good fun. Yeah. And even the even, of even that. funnier when it's a junior who does it and gets his fingers stuck. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is a t this is the type of thing. If you're going to start talking about these types of attacks, which everybody's going to be, and we're going to hear it at VMworld, we're going to hear it for the next six months because someone will keep venom alive, even though it's a poison oh. a poisonless thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's, one it's, of the it's, other it's things. a venomous snake, but it's a bit like those venomous snakes that you have at the holidays that they wrap around you. Yeah, I feel I feel I feel very sorry for the GSS folks at VMware who are getting phone calls on this, and you know they're I, all I'm envisioning them is sitting there sucking the venom out of a wound, and spitting it out, going, yeah, the, the, it just doesn't do anything, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, literally, with I, I was flying yesterday. I flew from San Francisco to Boston yesterday, and I had Wi-Fi on the flight. And I think I spent 90% of my battery on my on my uh, iPad Mini just in Twitter and email dealing with Venom, commenting on it, 
and telling customer, uh, pointing uh, TAMs and uh, customers to specific uh, information that is being handled by our security response team. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, the company that released this this um, exploit actually stated on their release that ESX and Hyper-V were not affected. Yet Didn't every stop. single press but completely the thing, ignored that fact. But, but, but when you have a large multinational company that spends a lot of money with VMware, they don't care if the site said VMware was not affected. They need something some usually in writing from VMware saying we are not affected. Yeah, true. Right. And, 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 you know, fair dues to them. They, that's, that's what, that, that's what their business requirement is. They can't say, Oh, well, I read it and it says you're not affected. Is that true? <laughs> right. So you have to answer. You have to answer, but I mean, I mean, VMware's handling this the right way. Microsoft is handling this the right way. Yep. Even rack space. Everybody is. But what I found was the press just overdid it by saying, you know, buried somewhere in the bottom it's of everything. The second coming of Heartbleed, yeah. Yeah, it's the second coming of everything. And that VMware and Hyper-V were not affected was really weighed down in the, in the minutiae that no one will get to. So yeah. it made it sound like everybody was affected when they really weren't. Right. I actually read some articles that didn't even mention anywhere in their pages that Hyper-V and VMware were not affected. So, I mean, it's always you know, crapping. You, you, you'd think it was Armageddon. <laughs> the world is going to end. Hey, maybe yeah. this is the virtual design master zombie 4000 that's going to happen next. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about day zero bugs like, you know, um, the bash one that was out there a while back and, and yeah. Heartbleed and stuff like that because that is just so pervasive everywhere. Yeah. Right. The bash one. And those, those are, you know, once those get out, once the details of those get out, the, it all goes back to patching. You better hurry up and patch. But it, um, it, it really means that, you know, the bad guys now have new tools to go off and go get into your systems and um, exploit. I mean, they're already uh, they're already in the script kitty, kitty repositories sure. anyways. Yeah. So people are just going to play with them anyways, regardless. So if you don't patch, you're up a creek. Yeah. But for every one of these things, every one of these attacks, like Venom and the 3D graphics driver one, and even Heartblade, there was a huge number of compensating controls you could put in place that would make you invulnerable to them in a lot of ways. So the question is, is do you really need, you need a patch? Absolutely. I'm not saying you don't. But what I am saying is, is that you really need to think about your security from a more holistic view. You need to look at it from the outside in and say, am I really vulnerable? Is there really, is, am I susceptible to heart bleed? I mean, there was a quick test you could have run and said, are you susceptible? If you had enough mitigation between you and the, the attack, the attacker, there was no way in the world you were going to be vulnerable. Yeah, well, that goes back to just a, a solid defense and depth strategy, doesn't it? Absolutely, right? where, and not that, that boring multiple, stuff. Multiple layers. The, the thing is, is with, the, with, with the bad guys, with the attackers, if you make it difficult for them, they're less likely to hang around, unless they're a nation state. Or um, they're paid. I mean, attackers do things for a number of different reasons. If they're a, a hacktivist, they may or may not stick around. Right. If they're paid to actually do what they're doing to you what, against your company or organization, they will stick around. If they're a nation state, they'll most likely stick around. But the general script kitty, the people that are just doing this because they can, won't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it all depends on their motivation. Absolutely. Right. There are serious bad actors out there. And I would argue that unless you are developing the next generation uh, strike fighter, you're probably not on the radar of certain nation states 
that have the capability to do the more interesting, shall we say, um, attacks. Absolutely. Right. And if it's, if, if you're getting compromised by script kitties, uh, it's a good possibility you need to review how you protect your environment. If you're getting compromised by nation state people, you probably have a dedicated security team. Or they're just practicing and you just happen to be collateral. Yeah. And that, I mean, all these people are going to practice, and if you're easy to attack, you become collateral damage as they practice their skills. Well, and, that, got, and that may get them caught. Go on, Tom. We, we, we've talked about this before. Always assume you're compromised. Absolutely. I tr it's a trust no one type of world, and you need all these different layers. I mean, you can't. We say, yeah, the M and M model is gone. Well, actually, the M and M's have gotten a whole lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah, I think the M and M's have actually not got smaller. They've got more. They've got more colours, and they've also got a lot more flavours. Well, that's one way to put it. There's a lot more of them now in your jar than there used to be, and the jar is not holding anything. <laughs> it's not, not glass. There's no crunchy outside. Everybody's pulling down their M&Ms in their jars. <laughs> <laughs> the general, when I we say that I had put them in my bag the other day, and I'm like, M&Ms? Crap, I've got some M&Ms. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought you were past the M&Ms sorting out, Mike. Yeah, well, they're all blue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we always say M and M's gone. We're we're crunchy on the outside. We're we're juice, uh, chocolatey and chewy and stuff like that on the inside. But to be honest, all we've done is shrunk where our our boundaries are. All these new technologies are about control, like Illumio, like Cloud Passage, which is not all that new. Um, even um, Vitter, which is actually a very interesting technology. I'd love to have them on are all about reducing that attack surface but but the problem is is that we're we're extending we're making instead of big perimeters we're making really a lots of little tiny perimeters all over the place and that's the management of that is becoming a problem so defense in depth is incredibly important whether it's a hi single hypervisor a cluster of hypervisors hybrid cloud it makes no difference the other thing about defense in depth is not only is it slowing the attacker down, a good defense in depth is allowing you, if, you, if they're tripping a number of layers, it's giving you more time to respond and to, and to catch someone coming in, right? If, uh, if, I have to, if I have to make my way through a minefield, I may occasionally step on a mine which would tell me, hmm, someone's trying to break in, right? Yep. Or mm -hmm. I may trip, you know, the sensor, the, the sound sensor or the, the motion sensor or whatever. I mean, it, it's just I keep a lock on the door and I have a motion sensor outside the door. I want to know that someone is coming to the door before they start to try and break it. Yeah, and that's actually kind of what Vitter does, so it's worth looking at that, Mike, if you haven't yet. V-I-D-D-E-R. Okay. Very, very cool technology for end-user computing. Actually, I think it's my cool tech of the week, but, but there's so many now. Um, you were going to say something, Tom. No, no, I'm, I'm just sitting here listening to two experts talking and just soaking, all, soaking it all in by osmosis. My IQ's probably gone up about 10% so far. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, so next week, I'm actually doing a class at Cloud Security World in New Orleans. And one of the things we're talking about is the holistic view of hybrid cloud security. In other words, the, the exactly what we're just talking about, defense in depth. And I'm sure Venom is going to come up. And that will be an interesting discussion about why people think they're vulnerable to it when there's no attack in the wild. And if you looked at it, I mean, Hoff was saying it and a lot of other people were saying it's like, yeah, we're, this is, this is nothing. It's not nothing as in, it's not true that the research wasn't done, but there's nothing in the wild to actually say that we're at risk now versus tomorrow. We have a little bit of time still to patch things before there's an attack. Oh, it's telling that most of the the key vendors that would be 
vulnerable to this have already either come out and said, no, we're not, or released patches. Right. I, and I know Red Hat has already because I got my patches yesterday almost immediately yeah, after Red it Hat was has, announced. Yeah, Red Hat has, Ubuntu has, CentOS have released theirs. So most of the major players have already released. F5 have released their patches. And, and, you've, and you've got to think that the, the nation states that do this for a living have probably known about this for a lot longer than the researchers who discovered and published it. Just and, guess. Well, just a guess there. And if they did, and if they could have done anything about it, I'm sure they kept it to themselves. Researchers like to have zero days in their back pocket. Absolutely. And that's why this is a very hard industry right now. I mean, I was at RSA conference, and the biggest thing I came out of there was if you looked at the innovation sandbox and the vast majority of the things that were on the show floor, it was all about detection. Mm -hmm. Can you detect an attack long before it actually becomes a massive problem? In other words, where's your early warning system? Right. And I still say for applications, which are still the vast majority of attacks are against applications. They're not against the hypervisors. They're against applications either for management or the control planes or the data planes inside the application. Yeah, I mean, you have, to, you have to give credit where credit is due. When was the last time you heard about a Microsoft Windows exploit? It's been a while. Been quite, they... It's been a good few years. Yeah, it's been a good few years. They they have been doing a really good job at locking down their system. I mean, it, it's helped tremendously that they finally put two in the hat of XP, you know. But even still, when was the last Windows 7 or Windows 8 exploit that got out? As a matter of fact, was didn't they do every year they have a contest about who can hack the computer the fastest any operating system? Right. Usually Linux is the slowest to hack. Windows is usually the first, but the last time I heard about it was actually the Mac that was hacked first. Right. Because, instead of the Windows box. Well so why why do you think people are going after Macs now? Well, every technologist at VMworld and EMC World and everywhere else, that's what they're using. It's also because the fact because that Mac, Macs are the BMW and Windows are the Chevy and sometimes sometimes the Hyundai and sometimes the Yugo. But well, at least um, they're not Pinto anymore. What, what but, Tom? You know, the, so the, at least the, they're no the, longer a Pinto. More, more affluent, I, I think it's safe, safe to say probably more affluent users have Macs, therefore yeah. they probably have more in their bank account. So therefore they're probably a better target. There's also the rather bizarre perception that you've got a Mac, you're safe because you right. can't be hacked. I mean, that was something that they used to throw out all the time. Well, that was popular. 99% of the yeah. hack, 99% of the hacks were against Windows XP. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, and while there's still attacks against things and everything, we need to make sure that we are looking at everything in depth. I mean, you got to really think about this more than just, hey, Venom is an attack against a peripheral device that is unused and has old code. There are a lot of those. You need to think about now, if you are saying, hey, how do I prevent Venom and Venomous, venomous type attacks like that, you need to start thinking about what's inside of each of your VMs. You need to start thinking about how to mask off whatever you need to mask off to make it so you don't have them there anymore. Well, Look through your VMs. Well, the you need. Yeah, get rid like, of them. Like, like you had said, um, you know, Venom was the way out of the VM. Yep. But I didn't see any stairs going from that door to anywhere else. Right. Yeah, there are none that I know of. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so someone opened a door, but where does it lead? It leads you know? into this black hole somewhere where you actually now have to get through to the other side and do something. I mean, the tools that attackers use when they write, write in memory outside of their own is to write something like a no-op slide or a number of different things. 
But once it's in that, that, that area that is outside of execution, you, it's hard to get it executed so it actually does anything. And if it does yeah. get executed to do anything, what's it going to do? It's not going to do a whole lot because there's nothing to grab onto. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of, uh, you know, any number of scenes from an Indiana Jones movie <laughs> where he's, he's made it into the country, he's made it, in, found the particular temple, he's made it through all of the different things, and he lifts up the, 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 the object that he's going to steal, and then everything just falls apart, right? So... I see the VM escapee sort of thing, like a Venom, as, okay, you made it into the VM, you got <coughs> moved, you did something, now what? Well, and if you made it into the VM, why would you want to go anywhere else? Because most likely you can get to the next VM anyways over the network connection. It's right. far easier for me to attack the application than it is for me to go and attack the hypervisor. Right, because it's very, very expensive to go down into a hypervisor and then go up into a VM. And not only that, you've got a limited number of VMs you're going to attack anyways because there may, for that application, there may be only three or four VMs on a house. There may only be ten. It's not like their people are running super dense, three yeah. or four hundred VMs on a house. Unless, they're, unless it's VDI and what information is in the VDI desktop. Well, once you get into one desktop, VDI, it's not going to be that amount of, right. you know, but they're all going to be the same machine anyway. Right. Well, use are different user profiles, which means that, and there's also different things in there. If you look at the memory of a VDI host, you will have the, the, basically the username and password in a hash format. Yeah, in memory. yeah true. But you've got to have something that can read that memory. And then wow. you're going to go after an application. And then you're going after an application or you're becoming yep. that user and going further and deeper into it. So you're actually attacking the network so anyway. That, 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 that there's bring, much that brings, easier ways of doing that. that Far that brings, easier. That brings up a good point then. Um, what is the goal of an attacker? Who? It's usually they're looking for some type of information, whether it's username, password, or... IP or um, account information like, you know, uh, bank account information or what have you, right? Why do they need to go through a hypervisor to get that? That's far easier to get attack the people. It's far easier to do the people. And it really depends on why they're yeah. doing it. If they're doing an attack against escape the VM, to be honest, they're probably trying to, that's a, a, a if that's their goal, they're either doing it because they want to do it and try to do it. And that's mm -hmm. just like the feather in their cap. I want to yeah, make sense at the beginning. I am, I am the next whoever. Right. But Kevin Mitnick. Yeah. Agree. I want, right. I want to, be, I want to spend the rest of my life on airplanes, going around talking about the fact that I escaped to VM in, and then spent 15 years in jail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> True. Well, well, you know, to to to, ment to in fairness to Kevin. Him and I did the Kansas City V Mug last year, and we were the keynote. I had pneumonia, um, and I talked about the whole VM escape thing and the improbability or impracticability of actually doing something like this. And I <clears throat> kind of capped it off with, you know, in my opinion, it's far easier to hack the people who have control over the hypervisor and all of the VMs. Kevin, do you have anything like that? And then he went in and he had jaws dropping. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's all about social Kevin, engineering. Kevin is more of a social engineer than a hacker. Yeah. And it's all about observation as well. And if Kevin and other people can observe those same things about the people, it is now time to teach the people how to protect themselves. And you don't go about it by telling them you have this draconian um, password policy or you have a new VPN or something like that. No, you need to teach people situational awareness about themselves. And the only way yeah, you can exactly. do that is to teach them how to protect their families. You know, teach, them how to, teach them how to deal with logging onto the VPN in a coffee shop. 
Well, and you right. can tell that people like that, it's like, where do you go in bank? I mean, if you lose all your money, what's going to happen? Well, this is what's happening. If you go into a coffee shop and use their Wi-Fi, it's a good chance that will happen. And they go, well, it never happened to me. And it's like you can prove it to them. Yeah. And it's about protecting themselves and their family. Yeah. And that will translate to a discussion of, hey, you know, I'm insisting on this type of protection in the workplace as well. If we can teach them that just that, just those simple skills, no matter how simplistic they sound, it is a far, far better place we live in. It's easier to oh. tell people to have a phrase that they can remember than telling them that they've got to have a 17 word character with character password with odd characters, numbers, capital letters. You know, Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you'll. Everyone will do what everyone else does. They'll stick it on a piece of paper underneath the monitor. <laughs> you know? This actually was a conversation on Twitter today. Um, I was saying that trainers need to actually stop using really stupid and easy to guess passwords and train people to, by doing it themselves during training, to use things like pass phrases that it makes logical sense where all those numbers and exclamation points are and question yeah. marks and what not you're you using. You mean like if you were taking like a VMware install config course? Yes. Thing? Instead of saying password one, two, three, it should be something else. It should be something legitimate. Because all you're doing is training the admin to use bad passwords and passphrases and to basically ignore yeah. security to start with. I, w I would argue that if you were sitting in on a on a vSphere install and config course, you probably should be a fairly senior admin who should know better. Unfortunately, the you're more just using password one, two, three, just because you want to take the course and you don't want to spend all your time trying to figure out stuff. And you're going to write, even if you came up with a passphrase at a course, you're probably going to write it in, in on, on the, the, the materials, which is going to be open while everyone goes off to take a, a bio break. I'm really not terribly worried about that. I'm more concerned with teaching people how to either come up with a really good passphrase that protects their vault of passwords. Like I use one password. I remember my passwords, to be honest. I have a vault in my head. I but don't it, have a vault for 700 passwords. But I don't have 700 passwords either. I actually keep all my passwords. I, I limit my what I'm doing through fairly strict measures. It's like I have passwords for very important things, and the rest of it doesn't make a difference to me because I don't use them. I had people tell me, well, I have, I have this service and this service and this service. It's like, okay, do you use them still? If you do, great. If you don't, why don't you cancel it? because it becomes just yet another weakness that you have to remember the password for it. And to be honest, one password in company in groups like that, and this is a, I, I'd love to have this conversation later, but I'd like to bring on an attorney for it. And that is, is that if something happened to one of us, can our family members get into those 700 odd services to clean them up or take care of them? Because they're our digital identity. Now we're, we've, Something happened to yeah, us, but digital so identity it, it, becomes part of our... In, and in that case, you can put that passphrase that unlocks your 1Password vault. And I think one pa someone on the 1Password community actually came up with a legal doc. And you would write your passphrase on that, and you would seal it in an envelope, and then you would put it in a lawyer's office or in a lockbox or some exactly. other sort of some other sort of safe place. Not not too dissimilar from having the two codes uh, in a missile silo. At some point, someone wrote them down, so someone knows them, right? Um, you know, and and you say to the executor of your will, here here's here's the oh, here's the key to the vault that opens up all of my accounts that I want you to delete. Exactly, and the, but the deletion services don't exist either. That's the thing. Now, not yet. Now, if you, if you're someone unscrupulous and you know you go into the into the, the into the, the the wake and you have my phone and I'm laying there and you put my finger on unlock and then go. Well, ah, uh, but remember, you got to be alive for that to happen. It requires know, blood just, flow, so that I, won't I, happen. I'm just saying. <laughs> Tom's put on his legal hat. I think he's thinking <laughs> I, about that I, one. 
He plays I am actually thinking on TV. about that one. Go on, John. I am actually thinking about that. By the way, you do know that I have a degree in law, don't you, Mike? No, I don't. Really? Yeah. yeah. So oh, you just brought a whole other dimension you into the, the conversation. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Well, guys, this has been another episode of the Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast. Thank you for joining me on a conversation about Venom and how, what you can do about it. Thank you. Thank you very much.